So good to be with you this morning. And I'm excited about continuing this series in the Old Testament, Revealing Jesus. I'm just so glad that God gave us some examples. But let's, uh, let's pray and ask God to be with us as we share this morning. I thank you, Lord, for your church. I thank you for a chance to look into your word. I thank you for what your word reveals. And I pray that your word would reveal Christ to us this morning in a beautiful and profound way. May your presence fill this place in an increasing manner this morning as we meet with you and meet with your truth. Transform us, we pray, in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. we're talking about perceiving Jesus. It's such an honor to be with you. Derek and I did a swap this morning. I hope he does good in Maple Ridge. <laughs> I'm sure they'll have a great morning. Um, we're talking about perceiving Jesus. And as I, we move towards Easter, I love like this emphasis on seeing how the Old Testament reveals glimpses of Jesus. And I, I think it was intentional. And when Jesus came to the planet, God was trying to help us actually perceive who Jesus would be, what he'd be like. And so he gave us these profound glimpses. And when I think about um, our difficulty to perceive him, like when, we, when he did finally come, people had a hard time recognizing who he was, right? Like he got instantaneous oppositions and enemy and all that kind of stuff, right? You guys have read the New Testament. It's pretty cool, right? Just wave at me. You're alive. Good. I know it's daylight savings. It's rough this morning. Praise God. <laughs> You're like, hey, we made it, Mark. Just get over it. Okay, I'll settle. I'll settle for a lack of, you know, response this morning. I'll settle. I get it. What is it about humans, though? What is it about us that tends to see things the way we want to see them? And when we, when we get that way, we actually have a hard time really seeing things for what they are. What do you mean? Well, they had a difficult time recognizing Jesus because they were expecting a different type of Jesus. Because the Jesus they were expecting was based on their perception of what the Messiah should be. As a human being, I feel like I have a tendency to trust my perception. Anybody relate to that? Like the way I see the world or the way I view you or others or the way things are working, we, we trust our perceptions. How do I know? Easy. Remember the last time somebody complained about you? What do you do instantaneously? You put up an argument in your head. You might not say it out loud, but in your head you're like, I'm, I'm a nice person, right? Oh, come on now, let's be honest. Your little voice goes to immediate self-defense. We assume a posture. It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm a decent fellow. Seriously. Just me? Come on, we have these arguments with ourselves all the time. And so we're going to take a look at a voice um, in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the prophet Isaiah. And he himself has a perception issue until the moment he doesn't. We trust our idea of what we are. We trust our ideas of what the world is like. And we even trust our ideas of what God is. And sometimes that blind trust actually causes us to miss the Messiah for who he is. And Isaiah had the same issue. In his writings, there's something about Isaiah's writings that are so profound and beautiful. Like he gives insight to the coming Messiah like no other prophet. There are some deep and rich passages, repeated passages about the coming Jesus. And, and they're so beautiful. And in my mind as I was going over the passage that we're going to talk about this morning, I'm like, why did he see the coming Messiah so clearly? Why is it that he saw him? And I think it was because of a moment in his life. If you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, in, the, in chapter 6, there's a story of an encounter with God. He has an encounter with God. Anybody know this story? Isaiah chapter 6. He's actually pulled into the throne room of God. And there before him is all the sights and sounds and even smells of the temple of God. And he's looking upon this unbelievable environment. And he's like gazing on a reality that he's like... God's like, I'm going to insist, Isaiah, that you see me so that when I send you, you're actually going to be able to speak from experience. And when you write about a Messiah, you're going to actually be able to reveal a Messiah that view, from a vantage point of seeing God. So he's, he's thrust in the temple and he sees these giant angels circling around the throne of God. Six wings they had, with two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they, they flew around the temple. And they sung this song, and he's like taking in the noise, and it says the noise is causing vibrations, so he's feeling the presence of God. And then he says there was this smoke hovering in the room, and he's smelling the presence of God, and he's listening to these words of affirmation. And I want you to know this. In this moment, this encounter with God, causes a revolution inside of him. So here's my first thought this morning. My first real thought is this. 
Let me suggest that a revolution of change is the very thing that reveals if you perceive Jesus as he is, not the version you want him to be. If there is no revolution in my life, then I haven't seen Jesus. I've seen maybe a, a, a glimpse of him or a piece of him, but knowing Christ in intimacy and in perfection and power should do something ridiculous in my life. I should not be the same human being. And that should be an ongoing process. It shouldn't be something I look back 30 years ago, oh, I was really changed, praise God. And I can say 30 years because I've been serving Jesus that long. I know I look much younger. <laughs> but I'm stiff now. Anyway. <laughs> so he's like in the temple. And he's in this moment and the sights and the smells and they're doing something in his spirit. And he throws himself on the ground and he utters this incredible line. He says, woe to me, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What he sees causes a drastic perception change in two things. In God, the way he sees him, and in himself, the way he sees him. And so years later, when he's going to write about a Messiah, it is this experience that is going to help him reveal a Messiah that no other prophet really sees, except because of him. Isaiah's new per perception actually impacts his posture. He suddenly is thrust to a moment of humility and, and he cries out for mercy and God responds in a beautiful way in this story. And I want you to read this story later, but we're going to read another passage, so I'm not reading it now. An angel comes and takes a coal from the altar and to this man who's in agony and in desperate arrogance, is confronted with his own desperate arrogance, the angel comes and he presses a burning coal to his mouth and he says basically... Your cry for mercy has been answered with the response of purification. In this moment, he has been forced to see himself in comparison with God. And in the years in front of him, he will proclaim words about Messiah in, that no other prophet would really see. Here's the thing. In the same way, our perception of Jesus is tied to how honestly we see ourselves. His ability to describe Jesus to us in advance is a result of what he saw of himself in the presence of God. Isaiah has incredible clarity into the kind of savior we require. And because of it, Jesus would relentlessly quote Isaiah. I mean, he quotes Isaiah like all the time. Because Isaiah saw him coming. A, a, a fullness of, of Messiah described in Isaiah. And some of you probably know what passage I'm going to go to because it's so famous. But I want you to imagine when Isaiah sits down to write Isaiah 53, that he does so from a context that he's been laid bare in the presence of God. He's had an encounter with the living Christ and he knows his God and he knows his need for a Messiah. And so he writes these words in Isaiah 53 that are so breathtaking and beautiful. And it goes like this. Verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their face, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. And surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed." We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow! This is the man who said, woe to me. I was walking in the woods yesterday and I was thinking about the moments that I've been overly frustrated or triggered to be angry about, oh, about a thousand things. And I knew God was calling me to a moment of repentance because you know in the moments you're frustrated and angry, you suddenly realize that what comes out of your mouth, there's a posture attached to it that impacts your attitudes and then your actions because your perception is flawed. And I just, I just felt so convinced that I needed God to cleanse my mouth and my heart. There are numerous prophecies of the Messiah in the book of Isaiah, but this one, this passage contains the insight of someone who has seen deeply And he opens with this thought. He says, who has believed? In other words, no one's going to believe this. No one's going to believe this Messiah is coming. This is going to be so shocking because what we want in a Messiah is some breathtaking and brilliant and, and light in the darkness who comes and sets the whole world to rights. But what Isaiah sees is this person coming from humility and meekness. It's going to be incredible and unlikely. And he begins to describe a Messiah, a Messiah who will emerge from a humble place. And so we know that our Jesus is born in a stable and raised in Nazareth, some obscure hamlet that was long forsaken of the Jewish culture. And he was raised in such a place that he was actually despised and rejected because of where he was from. When others saw him, it would not be obvious that he was in any way special. There wouldn't be anything about his appearance that would attract him. In fact, it would be the exact opposite. He would come from humble origins. And Isaiah, as a product of where he'd been, he knew he needed a different Messiah than the one that everybody else was looking for. He needed a Messiah that would come to him. Woe to me, I am. And he was unable to see the fullness of Jesus. Everybody was looking for the Messiah when Jesus came. They were all looking in incredible places. Nobody suspected he'd be born in a field, in a manger, and the shepherds would get to go first. No one would suspect that he would grow up covertly as the son of a carpenter. But Isaiah saw it coming. Why? Because of his posture. Everyone was looking for the, in the places where he should come from, right? Well, he should come from a place of power because he's going to come and he's, he's going to be powerful and he's going to set things to right. Everyone was looking for someone who would shake off tyranny. And, we, and I don't know about this, but there's a lot of that in the church these days. We're looking for someone to shake off the tyranny and oppression of, of government. And he says, I actually came for a different kind of freedom. Jesus came for a different kind of freedom. We have Canadian definitions of what it means to be free, but there's a biblical freedom. And the truth is he came to set us free. Jesus said, I have come that you would know the truth and the truth would set you at liberty. And this is the truth that Isaiah saw. I need to know the truth about my need for a Messiah. So he's standing in the presence of the, of, of the living God and he's already the man of God. He's already the declared prophet of God. So he's way ahead of me and he's way ahead of you. The people around him perceive him as the holy man and in the presence of God, he bows down and goes, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I'm walking in the woods yesterday going, I'm so sorry, God, for the flawed imperfection in me. Everybody was looking for a political savior, but Isaiah saw clearly 
It is human to believe that freedom is an external reality, a reality that liberates us to live the way we want. But is it true? Is it true? Not in the kingdom of God, it's not. Because when we are given that kind of liberty to do what we want, when we are given liberty that's based on our individual rights, we actually make our worst choices. We deeply indulge in greed and lust and desire. We trust our perception about how the world works instead of actually letting the, the, the Messiah of Jesus reveal what we need. And what we need is to walk in humility caused by a confrontation, con, a confrontation with the living Jesus. A big part of the truth that sets us free is this. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. And you can say to me, but, but Pastor Mark, I've given my life to Jesus and my sins are covered. Yeah, because he covered them. Because he covered them. And he does so every day. Because I still, though I'm looked at through the righteousness of Jesus, I still have a propensity to get angry about dumb stuff. To be greedy and self-absorbed and narcissistic. And so do you, if you're honest. And the only the thing that helps me see this is a living encounter with a real Savior. Isaiah perceived a Savior that will set you free from you. Isaiah saw a Savior that would set you free from you. Not from Trudeau. From you. He didn't go to the cross for just his sins. He went for my sins. He went for this imperfect person. And if I don't walk with a measure of humility, then I'm seeing Santa Claus, not a savior. I'm seeing someone who's come to give me the life I want instead of the life that he calls me to. He begins to unpack his definitions of what this Messiah will look like. And he says this, man of suffering, familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And the prophet begins to reveal what this Savior must endure to achieve our freedom. Some would say, they would come along and say that Jesus would suffer for his own sin. But we know better. We know better that in the presence of God, Isaiah saw that our freedom would cost the Messiah pain. And he would be pierced and crushed. Which is literally the language of crucifixion. 700 years he's describing piercing. 700 years before Jesus faces the earth and he sees his need. He hearkens back to a moment where he's like, I needed a, a savior who will save me from me. He must be pierced because I am a man of unclean lips. My people are broken and sinful and we need a savior and he will have to be crushed. This is the Messiah Isaiah saw coming. This is the Messiah Isaiah knew he required. And this is the only Messiah that can set us free. So what do you see in Jesus? I hope you see a God who loves you. We would love to have a political savior, one that would ensure our comfort. But sometimes we're also looking for a savior who's just okay with the way we live. You know what, Jesus, I love you. I give you my heart, you know, forgive me my sins. Just don't, don't talk to me about my sin. Just let me live my life. And we become more and more like the culture around us. And we wonder, outside the presence of a living encounter with God, why we don't look different than the world in conviction, in the success of our marriages. When's the last time you wept in the presence of God and realized, Mark, you are a man of unclean lips. Oh God, that you would take a coal to my mouth and you would purify me. It is humility that makes me a better human being, not my perception of the world. My perception of God changes me. It sparks a revolution. And without a revolution, there is no real change. I misshape Jesus into something I want him to be instead of something that he is. What I need is someone who will embrace suffering and pain on my behalf. It is my sin that held him there.
The prophet who sees with the most clarity reveals a servant who must come to suffer because of us. There are way too many people who call Jesus Savior but live as if they're entitled to the cross. There's no revolution of change. Their morality, their ethics aren't revolutionized by his goodness. But it's our transgression. It's our iniquities. We all like sheep have strayed. Isaiah saw this in the presence of God. It's me. It's Mark. It's you. And now emerges the Messiah who must be crushed, pierced and crushed by the weight of our sin. Isaiah saw a servant who must suffer, and he also saw Messiah's response to the demand. It was the response of Jesus. And he begins to say, silent, he would go. Oh, guys, the first moment of our suffering, we get loud and whiny. Come on, we do. I do. I'm such a baby. But I hate it when the church is a baby. When we're supposed to walk with humility and grace and actually embrace the path of Jesus. He took our sin and shame and in silence he would surrender. Isaiah sees what we should see. Something we too often fail to see. The Messiah will submit because of our guilt and he will sacrifice willingly for our rescue. Now it's my turn to sacrifice for him. What does it mean to see Jesus with clarity? It means to embrace sacrifice. It means to not call every suffering the enemy. And it means to actually decide that some suffering is actually for the will of God. But to take heart that he has overcome the world. In this life, you shall have some bad days. He kind of referred to that. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We walk with humility and sometimes you get run over when you walk with humility, but you still shine like Jesus. You walk with sacrifice and embrace and the people say, why are you like that? Why do you sacrifice and suffer for a, for a God you can't even see? Because you have experienced the life and grace of Jesus and you know it was your sin that put him there. It was mine. I'm really loud this morning. <laughs> but we get loud when our perception of the Messiah gets twisted. We start to fight for ourselves and call it fighting for Jesus. We fight for our comfort because we are comfortable. And he goes gently and quiet. If not for him, I am bound for hell. There are some mornings in church we need to talk about it. There are some mornings we need to weep in the presence of God. And there are other moments we need to rejoice. And too, too much of one or the other is a problem. And this morning God is calling us to attend to a Savior who had to suffer. It literally says, Isaiah said, it's literally the Lord's will to crush him. And then in response, Jesus says to his followers, take up your cross daily, die to self and follow him. Follow him to what? To sacrifice. To living in a way that benefits others. I don't know where you're living, but are you walking with humility knowing your need for a savior? And that had to be crushed because of your sin. And does that perception actually impact the way you live? We imagine that Jesus is somehow deeply interested in giving us the life we desire, when in fact he's deeply interested in giving us the life he desires for us to have. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. He has a deep hope for your life, a deep and profound and beautiful hope for your life. But it's a life that reveals his freedom, and that definition of freedom, not mine. Isaiah saw this. And in my mind, the clarity with which Isaiah perceived the Savior and his need of one enabled him to accept his difficult role as a servant. In, traditionally, it says that he would, he would actually go on to embrace unbelievable sacrifice. And tradition suggests that he was eventually sawn in two. Like, with a saw. That's what sawn means. You don't embrace that kind of sacrifice unless you've seen clearly the eyes of God. So he takes me back on this journey in Isaiah 6. And he takes me forward to Isaiah 53. And he sees this need for a savior. And he embraces sacrifice and suffering. 
We whine about petty things. We fight for individual rights. All the while we are surrounded by injustice, real injustice that the kingdom grieves over. And we wonder why the world thinks we're crazy sometimes. Could it be that sometimes we have missed the view of the Messiah that we actually need? It was my sin. I put him there. It's so tempting for me to believe sometimes that Jesus suffered so that I don't have to. But is that why he suffered? If we fail to receive this suffering servant as Messiah, we'll fail to know the freedom that comes from enduring pain on his behalf. But it's not all pain. Isaiah comes to a close with this. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. My righteous servant will justify many. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And so reveals the outcome for the life God gives to Jesus and the outcome for every one of us. We have a portion with Jesus. Come on, church. What Savior do you perceive? It was my sin that put him there. The Savior I require. The Savior your neighbors, your friends, your enemies require. And the only path to freedom. It's not found on the streets, folks. It's found in the temple. In the presence of the living God. Where you see your need for salvation. And you see a Messiah that's come to rescue you from sin and shame. You know what happens when we daily go into the presence of God? We walk with humility and grace for the people around us. You know what happens when we walk apathetically without the presence of God? We fight for self. We fight for us. We get angry about things that are going to perish. And we forget about the unperishable things. We get obsessed about defending our little corner of the world instead of advancing the kingdom of God. And pretty soon the church is a shadow of what it's meant to be. We're supposed to be light in the darkness. Life to the broken. Advocating for those who cannot advocate for themselves. And when we fail to see our need for a savior on a regular basis, we fight for us. And the world is confused. Not like it wasn't before. When I think about my perception of Jesus, if I don't perceive Jesus in a way that promotes a deep humility in my life, then my perception is incomplete. And if that doesn't get promoted in our church, oh, I dream that we would be a church that walks through town with a depth of humility and grace, knowing that we are incomplete and imperfect and that we needed a savior who would suffer and die for us. What beauty would come from those ashes, church? What grace, what generosity, what freedom? Anybody want to be free this morning? Can I just grab a communion cup? We're going to go to a moment of communion. If you didn't Get one, the ushers are moving through. You just raise your hand and they'll bring you one. It's imperative to me, hey church, as you're struggling to get the tricky cellophane wrapper off. It's imperative to me that you do not partake of this unless you're right with God. And before we do this, we're just gonna take a moment and sit and sit in it. Our need for the Savior Isaiah perceived, a suffering, wounded for my iniquities, broken for my transgressions, the punishment that brought us peace and the the stripes that healed me. I just want you to sit. Don't you think it's appropriate before we go to communion that we just sit in our need for that Savior? Church, bow your heads. Actually, I'd love us to stand.
Would you stand and then bow your heads? Close your eyes. Let yourself wander into the throne room of God right now. Perceive what Isaiah saw, the holiness and awe and wonder of God who's so far above and beyond us and your deep need for his help and his healing. And the good news, church, is that it's available right now. Isaiah also spoke this of the Messiah. He said, the spirit of the sovereign God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And then Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. In other words, they know they need more of God for they shall be filled If you know you need more of God, I just want you to hold your hands out like this this morning, church. Just like this, in a posture of need. And meditate on your own need for a Savior. Forgive me of my greed, Father. Forgive me when I have gotten angry for the wrong reasons. Forgive me for words that are ruthless slanderous, false, caustic, mean. Forgive me for actions that are overflow of forgetting to look at you first. Forgive me for the shallowness of my life and the imperfections of my faith. And forgive me for my propensity, O God, to sin. Forgive me, God. Forgetting forgetting angry with even your people. Forgive me for forgetting that you are with me, even through deep moments of agony, suffering and and, and pain. Forgive me. Go ahead, church. Before we take the bread, before we take this wafer, Just tell them that you need a savior. Maybe it's the thousandth time you said it, maybe the 10,000th. Tell him again in his presence. Holy Spirit, I just lose the fullness of your presence in this room, that you would catch us up in the power of God, that we would know the fullness of your grace and conviction, that we would honor you in our response to the goodness of God. You have rescued us from sin, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for me, crushed, bruised, beaten for me, for you. Say thank you and then take it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then he took the cup. This is the covenant made in my blood, which he poured out for the sins of mankind. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember... Remember, church, your need for a savior. Remember your need for a suffering servant, for one who would embrace pain, who would go silently before his accusers, who would stand before a governor and utter not a threat or call down power, but embrace a chain of sin so that we could be free from the things that strangle us. By his stripes, we are healed. Forgive us, Father. 
when our perception is blind to the truth of who you are. Thank you for the gift of your son, for the blood of Jesus. For the blood of Jesus. Go ahead and take the cup. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the moments that we just need to sit in the heaviness of God and recognize how holy and pure you are and remember what it cost Jesus for our salvation for forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Anybody feel like it might be an appropriate response to worship the Lord right now? Thank you. The team's gonna lead us for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands like this, church, again. Bow your hearts in humble reverence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, your mercy triumphs over judgment. Love wider than horizon. Stronger than all sin Lord, your kindness Leads us to repentance To the heart of God Your heart, oh Is all I want. Your mercy triumphs over judgment. Love wider than horizons, stronger than all. Lord, your kindness leads us to repentance to the heart of God, your heart of All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence day
God, that's what we want. We want to see you. We want to see you, God. We want to see the kindness of Jesus. We want to know the mercy of the Father. God, not so that we can hoard it, so that it actually causes a revolution in our lives. You know, people recognize that Jesus has made an imprint in our souls. We need you, God. We need mercy every day. That you would forgive us, oh God, when we have trusted our perceptions instead of being shaped in the presence of God. God, bring us back to our first love. It is Jesus crucified for our forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your rich mercy. May we walk in it today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to invite the prayer team to come. Well, hey, thanks so much for being with us today on Church Online. We hope that it was encouraging for you wherever you tuned in from today. If you're brand new with us, we are so glad that you joined us today. Would you do us a huge favor, though, and just grab your phone and scan the QR code that's on the screen right now and just fill out our digital connect card. One of our team members would love to reach out to you, say hi, and see how we can just best connect with you and engage you here in the life and ministry of CLA. A few announcements before we send you off this afternoon. First of all, we've been continually um, involved in the ongoing crisis that's going on in Ukraine right now. And our hearts are moved with compassion towards all that is going on there. And so we want to let you know that we are still receiving funds that we are sending to our partner churches who are in Poland uh, right now who are actively receiving Ukrainian refugees. And so if you would prayerfully feel compelled to give this afternoon, you can go ahead, just scan the QR code that is on the screen right now or head to our website and you can make a donation that way. Again, all of the funds are going right now initially to our partner churches um, and organizations in Poland who are receiving refugees on the ground. I also want to let you know something really cool that's happening uh, this week is we have just launched a new devotional series that is live on our YouTube channel. And you might have received a book from Pastor Derek in the mail. If you haven't received that book, just reach out to us. Um, but we've sent you a gift. And along with that book, again, we've put on this exclusive uh, online devotional series on our YouTube channel. So go to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that at youtube.com slash CLA church. And you can track with us through this devotional um, series that also goes along with the book. And we'd really love for all of our church family to engage in this together. Lastly, before I send you off today, I just wanna give you the opportunity to partner with us through financial giving. Hey, if this is your first Sunday with us, feel absolutely no obligation to give whatsoever. We are so glad that you joined us today and we hope that the service was a gift for you. But if you would call Christian Life Assembly your home, would you prayerfully consider partnering us partnering with us through financial giving uh, as we just continue to join God in transforming lives. Something new that's rolled out is we've actually rolled out a new giving platform. I'm sure you've heard about it a whole lot, but it actually gives you the option to cover the fees of the online transaction. That's just really helpful for us so we can continue to put all of the resources that God has given us into impactful ministry in our community, our nation, and our world. And so thank you so much for being with us today on Church Online, and we'll see you next week.